Okay, I can see, uh, hopefully people can hear me okay. I can see people uh, joining. Um, I'm going to uh, leave people to join for a um, couple of minutes and then we'll uh, get started on the, uh, the uh, event. I can see Paul has joined, which is great. Morning, Paul. And sounds good. Thanks, Steve, for letting me know. This sounds good. That's good. Um, and I'm going to put up this holding slide. Yeah, so I'll just give uh, people a couple more minutes to uh, join and then we'll start at about five past. If people want to, but obviously there's no obligation to do so, but if people want to put in the chat, you know, who they are, um, who they represent as an organization or uh, anything like that, then please, um, please feel free to do so. But you don't have to. It's just good to see uh, who, you know, who we've got on the call. That's great. It looks like we've got a lot of uh, people working for services who work with men here. So that's that's great. And Jenny's on the call. Hi, Jenny. Lots of individual practitioners as well. Um, fantastic. <clears throat> yeah, so for those for those joining, I'm just going to wait a couple more minutes, um, see how many we get on the call and then we'll uh, make a start. Now I'll, I'll do some housekeeping uh, in a second and then uh, give a quick overview of the organization and what, what we're looking to do. And uh, then it will be yeah, a couple of presentations and hopefully a lot of time and room. I'm going to try and make sure there's time and room for questions and, and chat um, at the end of the three uh, presentations. That's great. It's really great to see um, so many service providers on the call, which is excellent, and uh, fellow academics and uh, also people with lived experience as well, which is always uh, really, really useful. Yeah, so for, for those people who've just joined, um, if, if people want to, then under no obligation to do so, but if people want to, uh, you know, just say who they are and who they work for, if, if they work for an organisation in the chat, uh, it'd be good to see who we've got along today. Um, and I'm going to give it one more minute and then we'll make a start because I really want to make sure that we've got time for uh, discussion at the end. Oh, Natalie uh, Quinn's here as well. Who I follow, follow her work, which is great. And really, you know, really good to see uh, individuals with lived experience on the call as well. And, um, you know, it's always good to hear, you know, about lived experiences and whether it chimes with, you know, the research that we're presenting, because you know, at the end of the day, we want that to be, uh, you know, useful um, in shaping provision and things like that. OK, look, I'm going to make a start. Um, and if people uh, join, um, we can catch them up. 
So I want to welcome everybody uh, here to this uh, first official uh, EBDARN uh, research seminar. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about what EBDARN is and what we're looking to do in a second. But I want to basically thank you all for coming onto the call um, this morning and expressing an interest in this uh, area of research. Many of you will have been at uh, previous seminars that were held in July um, by University of Central Lancashire, uh, Nikki Graham Cavan and Deborah Powney's work on coercive control and, and Liz Bates, who's going to speak this morning, also spoke at that event. Um, so, yeah, it's really nice to see people coming back and attending these events and, and learning a little bit more about this population and hopefully uh, other populations as well in terms of domestic abuse. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to um, do a bit of housekeeping. Um, so actually, I'll leave this slide up whilst I do that. So just a bit of housekeeping this morning. This session is being recorded um, and will be made available. I'm not overly sure through which channel we're going to make it available yet, but it will be available and it will go out uh, to everybody who signed up to this event to, to show where you can access it. So it will be available at some point uh, in the near future. Um, we wanted to make this seminar as accessible as possible. And actually, I think one of the COVID learning lessons is that actually we can do these events online in a really product productive way. So I am uh, obviously still working from home. Um, so if there are any tech issues, we will look to resolve those um, as quickly as possible. Um, a couple of things about how we utilize the forum. I'm sure everybody's going to be very familiar with Zoom by now. Um, but if you're not, there are several functions that you can use. Um, if you want to say something um, in real time, then you can use the raise hand function and we'll endeavor to answer that inquiry in, in real time. What I would love for people to do is to try and use the Q&A function. Um, so there is a, a specific Q&A uh, process where you can kind of log a question and then when the panel uh, have time and at the end we can get to those questions. Um, and the chat function you can use the chat function. Um, I would say if you have a specific question, use the Q&A. If it's that you want to make a comment or you're responding to something someone else has said, then yeah, by all means, use the chat and we will endeavour to keep up with the chat as well. But obviously we have over 100 people on the call today, which is excellent, but the chat can become quite, uh, you know, uh, excessive. And if we keep to the Q&A, that would be really useful for us. And the last thing I just want to say is, you know, we're talking about um, a really important research area, but people do have different approaches and perspectives. And we just want to make sure that we have a robust but polite and civil discussion about different kind of matters and things like that. Um, but if you're on this call, hopefully it's because you're interested in this area. And uh, if you're working for a service, it's because you want to learn more about how you can support this population. Um, so I'm just going to stop. Uh, sharing that screen and I'm going to share uh, a different screen. <clears throat> See, I say I say we're all familiar with, with Zoom and how it works. This is me uh, getting there in the end. OK, so um, the first thing I want to do this morning before I give my presentation, so for five minutes, I just want to introduce this new uh, network. So we're called EBDARN, and it's the Evidence-Based Domestic Abuse Research Network. Um, and this has been formed by a few colleagues across different universities with the aim of providing robust, empirically-based research around mainly hidden or overlooked populations in relation to intimate partner violence and familial violence. Um, and, uh, you know, a number of us work with, uh, you know, what we call more visible populations, so for example, female victims, but we really wanted to kind of come together and start to piece together a robust, clear evidence base uh, for uh, more kind of hidden uh, populations. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a network. We've got groups of academics across four UK universities, um, and those universities are University of Central Lancashire. And again, many of you will have been to the coercive control events that were run in July. Um, University of West London, which is where I'm based, University of Cumbria and Nottingham Trent University. And we're joining forces to kind of provide new and exciting, but also accessible research. And we want to um, utilize events like this to deliver findings directly to those who need them and who want to learn more about these populations. And this can include 
service providers. And like I said, it's really nice to see so many on the call, but also other academics, policy makers and the general public as well. Um, and we'll talk about why uh, the general public element of it is so important um, in a second. Um, so just a little bit more about the four universities. So like I said, we have University of Central Lancashire and the lead academic there is Nikki Graham Kavan, who um, is an absolute powerhouse of an academic. Um, and she has uh, spearheaded and led this initiative. Um, and many of you have seen her speak and speak very passionately about these different populations. So uh, she's the lead there, but lots of other researchers there as well. Uh, University of West London, where I'm the lead, um, principally focusing on yeah, stereotypes and perceptions around male victims. Um, Liz at the University of Cumbria, who'll be speaking this morning um, and is arguably the UK's leading voice on male victims. Um, and also uh, Dr. Jenny Mackay at Nottingham Trent University, who will be leading on uh, principally perpetrator research, but also doing some really interesting research on uh, uh, healthcare professionals, HCPs, and their approach to victims, um, and doing a wonderful study involving paramedics at the moment. And the, like I said, the principal thing we want to use this uh, consortium or group as a vehicle for is to provide events for uh, the general public, practitioners, policymakers, etc. And you can see here we've got a series of events coming up. Um, We've had two already, we have one this morning, and then later in the month on September 22nd, and this will be sent out via uh, the UCLan mailing list, um, but also do email me if you want to join the EBDAR mailing list as well. We're gonna have a special seminar just on LGBT victims of family violence, and um, I'll be presenting, uh, Philippa Lasky at Cumbria will be presenting on all of her great work with LGBT victims. And we're also gonna have a representative from Gallup, which is the UK's leading LGBT domestic violence uh, organisation speaking at that as well. And then, as you can see, throughout the rest of the year and then into next year, um, depending on how dates line up, we're going to have the organisations involved delivering specialist seminars on different populations. So Liz is going to be doing a, a seminar on the services in the UK, so the kind of landscape of services in the UK for victims. Um, Jenny is going to lead a session on IPV perpetrators and her wonderful research looking at uh, the kind of pathways to perpetration in male and female perpetrators. And then we're going to have dedicated sessions on interfamilial violence, bi-directional violence, and then violence towards and involving children um, in December. So lots of really, really great work. And if you want to sign up to the EBDAR mailing list, then please do just email me and I'll add you to that. Um, but all of this will also come through the University of Central Lancashire mailing list that we use to mail out about this event as well. Um, yes, so uh, the other thing to just point out is that these uh, four universities um, are the kind of uh, lead organisations that formulated EBDAN, but it's not a, an exclusive club um, and it's, it's not, uh, you know, we're, we're, not, we're not the only ones doing this research, we just know of each other. And we would invite academics from universities across the UK if they want to join and they want to kind of contribute to this research, then absolutely. And we're hoping to have a website very shortly, although I have learned a lot in the last couple of months about how difficult it actually is to put together a website, which has been a real learning experience, not just the physical putting together of it, but also the getting approvals and all this kind of thing. But we should have it very shortly and that will give a really nice gateway to recent up and coming kind of research as and when it happens, um, as well as these events. Um, OK, so that's that's everything to do with EBDAN and, and you know, why we're having these seminars. Um, I'm just going to quickly deal with the two questions in the Q&A. Uh, the recording will be made available and a link will be sent when we decide exactly where that's going to be um, uh, processed. And then, uh, yeah, someone said, I've seen a University of Northern Ireland on the list. You know, like I said, it's it, these four universities are leading EBDAR, but we, we would invite and welcome academics from across the UK to, to contribute their research. Um, OK, so the first presentation I'm going to deliver. So I'm just going to uh, pop that up uh, now. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about principally is a series of three studies that I've conducted over the past 18 months on male victims of domestic violence and abuse. Um, and what we can take from those studies. And I think 
you know, I'm not going to focus too heavily um, on what was done and how it was done, because that's much more for, you know, the, the psychologist in us. It's more about what do the results mean and what can we do with those results in a, in a service setting, for example. So, um, yeah, I'm going to speak for about 30 minutes. I hopefully have, we'll hopefully have time within each presentation for a few questions at the end, and then we'll have a kind of panelists question section at the end of all three presentations. So just a little bit of background. Um, we're starting to get to a position within the academic literature where we are starting to see a growing evidence body around male victims of IPV and what they look like and what their experiences are and what the impacts are of the, of the abuse that they experience. Um, and principally, the key finding so far is that male victims suffer a wide range of abuse um, similarly to female victims or, or any other group of victims and really starting to reinforce this idea in, that's the spirit behind you know governmental and, and global definitions of domestic abuse that it can happen to anybody and we're seeing evidence of physical psychological sexual financial coercive control behaviors towards men um, and interestingly within that research we're starting to see some of the gender specific details that are coming out so it can either be a prevalence issue so it could be that this is something that male victims of IPV are experiencing to a greater extent but it can also just be that the the kind of impact of gender um, is how those experiences are shaped so it's not necessarily that one or other group is experiencing more of that behavior it's just that this inf gender influences how they experience that behavior so one of those examples is what we term legal and administrative aggression, which is where systems are utilized against male victims. And these might be systems that are maybe traditionally oriented towards women and female victims that are maybe used against men. Um, and an example of that, although this is highly contentious and we'll get to this later, but is a family court system, for example, and uh, Paul will have plenty to say on this later. Um, and Liz and I's work has really started to, to point in the direction of how the manipulation of parental relationships is utilized as an avenue of coercive control and we're starting to slowly bring together and this is why this seminar is is um a, a joint seminar about ipv and parental alienation because we're starting to gently marry those concepts together um, and to understand that actually parental alienation in all likelihood uh, constitutes a um, avenue of coercive control and ipv rather than a kind of separate concept as it were um, and there are also issues like false allegations. And again, this is the point where I would stress it's not that these things don't happen to women. It's just that we're seeing some kind of gender specific nuances here that are shaped by the general experience of, quote unquote, being a man. And of course, within this group, you know, we, we, we're talking about men as, a, as this big homogenous group, which we know that they're not. Within this, there will be specific avenues and, and uh, subsets of abuse and populations like gay and bisexual and transgender men um, and we're seeing more and more evidence about what abuse looks like towards those populations um, and there'll be much much more of that to come on the 22nd of September with Philippa's uh, brilliant work as well um, and correspondingly we're starting to see more and more and more research about the impact of abuse because when we're chipping away at these uh, layers of belief around male victims if we get past that first hurdle of understanding that male victims exist and they experience abuse, the next hurdle is often someone turning around and saying, yes, but they can deal with it better or it doesn't affect them as much. Well, actually the literature is starting to demonstrate, again, that's not the case rather predictably because abuse is abuse and it affects everybody. Um, and there's a lot of studies that are coming together showing the wide range of physical and mental health impacts on men of abuse itself. Interestingly, we're starting to understand how men process that impact. So, for example, do they externalize more, uh, engage in things like drinking and drug taking, etc., self harm? We're starting to understand whether that is the case. Um, I'm just picking up something in the chat very quickly. Yes, the slides will be made available after the presentation, absolutely. And through that, people can get access to the various publications. And once we get the website up and running, there will be a list of publications on there as well. Um, and, you know, studies also demonstrating that men, similarly to female victims, experience levels of PTSD after their abuse. 
Um, substance use and misuse is particularly prevalent in GBT populations. And again, my own research on case reviews and Philippa's research will, will speak to that on the 22nd. And Liz and I have been looking into more and more and more how the relationship with men's children is affected through this process as well, and how uh, any abuse involving children against the men themselves also has a further impact, if not the greatest impact, on uh, their, their uh, health. Um, and I was actually speaking to another charity uh, yesterday, in fact, about how uh, about 60% of the clients that they deal with in terms of family breakdown are experiencing suicide ideation um, through lack of contact with their children. And again, something that Paul will speak to later, I'm sure. And across all of this research, we see stereotypes coming through again and again and again, and how men's experiences are shaped by stereotypes in society about how men are quote unquote meant to be and meant to act, particularly in their help seeking and in their experiences with service provision. They have a whole range of reactions from outright dismissive through to kind of mocking through to um, wanting to help, but not really actually knowing how to do that because the service doesn't really deal with men. So there's lots and lots of layers of impact there. Um, and we'll explore that in the data in a second. Um, and GBT men experience additional barriers due to additional stereotypes, you know, uh, late, you know, late, I say latent and often obvious homophobia present in society as well. And that's led Liz and other researchers like Huntley to state that provision for men is at best mixed um, and at worst, uh, I'm sure you can fill in the blank. And more research is needed to understand the needs of men. And that's what these seminars are designed to do is to deliver those findings directly to service providers to help shape those experiences. So what I want to do now is talk about, okay, what new research is available? And I'm going to talk specifically about my research and then Liz will talk about hers as well. So I'm going to talk about three studies um, that I've done over the past 18 months. So one of them is a qualitative study, which was interviews with call handlers at a phone line for abused men. We then also looked at the just the quantitative data, so the numbers behind those calls. What were men calling about? What did they want? How long were the calls, et cetera? So those come as a kind of pair of studies, which are really illuminating. And the last that I want to talk about is how we can use big data, big client case reviews, to understand are there any differences in the needs between men and women and how we can use probability data to greater effect than simply the numbers. So let's talk about study one first, would seem a good place to start. Um, this study utilized semi-structured interviews with four call handlers. And all, basically that means sitting down, having a, a rough kind of guide as to how the uh, questions are gonna go, but also allowing the interviewees to talk about their experiences freely. Um, this was from a, an organization that runs a confidential helpline available to male victims of domestic abuse. Um, and all the participants, uh, i.e. all the call handlers that work at this organization are female, but they've worked for a wide range of years at the organization and both and within the sector as well. And the interviews were analyzed using a process called thematic analysis, which essentially looks for themes across the data. So what are participants saying and, you know, how do these concepts group together? OK, as reflective of the previous research in this area, stereotypes and expectations of men were the overriding factor in all of the kind of answers and the participants. So if we're gonna take anything from this study, it's that the stereotypes around masculinity and men are the most important thing really to consider if you are a service that works with men. That, that's the take home message. And I can go into all the details, that's the take home. We have to understand the kind of societal and, and stereotypic structures that men are operating within, which is, all of those unhelpful notions of gender and masculinity that we're aware of, be strong, be stoic, be independent, be dominant, all of the things that basically sit completely opposite to victimization and vulnerability. So if you are a service working with men, you have to understand that if they've approached you, it means they've already made some kind of massive leap of overcoming those stereotypic barriers. And that's something that as a service, you need to understand and, and, and work with. Um, so this, this quote, you know, I have guys call me and say, I can't be the victim of domestic abuse. So a lot of the time for men, it's actually about overcoming those stereotypes and actually recognizing that they're being abused in the first place to even come forward to the service. And what that translates to from a service point of view, and we'll see this in the data later, is validation, is saying to the man, 
okay, I believe you. Because everything in the man's mind is telling them, and the male victim's mind is telling them, you can't be a victim. And then when you get into the, uh, the actual accounts, um, albeit they're shaped by those stereotypes, but what does that actually look like? The types of abuse, again, call handlers said they get the whole range. So again, supporting this idea that men can be abused in, in any way possible. And that recognizing and accepting the abuse was a huge barrier and actually something that call handlers was one of their main jobs, was about talking through with the male victim about what they were going through and helping them to recognize and accept that yes, maybe they are being abused. Um, and that's principally what the men wanted from the call. Um, in terms of the outcomes and impact, again, mirroring the literature that you have at the moment, huge physical and uh, mental impacts from the abuse of where, as well. Um, and also the outcome and impact of the disbelief and expectations. So the fact that men, for example, had stayed in the relationship, maybe because they didn't recognize their abuse or they'd stayed because, you know, they didn't, uh, you know, they didn't want to lose contact with their children because there's the expectation that they wouldn't have this after they left. So all of this kind of massive impact of that disbelief and expectations as well. The other theme that came through was family and friends. And this feeds into this idea that men maybe aren't the ones to recognize their own abuse. Often it's other people that do it for them. So, um, you know, it might have been a family member that prompted them to seek advice. So they, you know, they were calling and saying, well, my daughter has been telling, telling me for years that I'm being abused, but I haven't believed her. And now I finally listen to her. And that came, that came from a desire to protect. Um, and uh, you can see this, this participant here, all of these are uh, pseudonyms, so it's not their real names, but this participant, Abigail said, I would say the most difficult callers are mothers and sisters, because again, we want to fix it. We know what it is, we recognize it, and we want an agency to tell us how to make our loved one recognize what's happening to them and recognize what's wrong. And so, you know, just as uh, people uh, call and, and speak on behalf of female victims, we see that m massively being the case uh, with with men as well. Um, barriers and challenges were, were was the third theme, um, and this was for men, but also for service providers. And again, this is partly what this seminar is designed to do: is maybe help with some of those barriers for service providers as well. I do see, I note a raised hand, and I'll come to that in a second. Um, so for men, the barriers were barriers to recognition barriers to understanding that they were being abused. But then once they had that realization, there were other barriers as well. They didn't want to leave because they didn't want to have to leave their children. Children came up a lot. And again, this is something we'll be speaking to in the rest of the seminar. Um, and also their financial kind of obligation. They felt financially entrapped because they would have to pay for everything that was happening in the house they've just left and also for a new dwelling as well. So there were lots of barriers there that, again, were related to those stereotypes around maybe breadwinning and providing. And for service providers, it was the challenge of, surprise, surprise, underfunding. Yeah, so they were saying that it was a complete postcode lottery as to what they were going to be able to deal with. And when we look at refuges, for example, as, a, 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 you know, as an example of a funding uh, stream, you know, there are extremely limited refuge spaces in the UK, none of which provide space for a male victim to go with their children. So there is clearly a big issue and barrier there for service providers in terms of funding. So what are the conclusions from this first uh, study? So the evidence base surrounding men's victimization is growing, and this study has obviously contributed to that. And the consistent theme was about stereotypes around men and masculinity because they're hugely influential in men's experiences and help seeking. Um, and these have to be challenged in order to improve victim experience. And this is something that I've spoken to previously. And hopefully this is again, uh, and I said before about the importance of having the general public on calls like this, is to start to erode this idea that men uh, can't be victims and to actually introduce this idea that men can be victims, they need our support. And in providing that support, they need to be gender inclusive. And we'll talk a little bit more about what that means um, in a second. And in the short term, helping men to recognize and report abuse is paramount. And it appears that validation is, principal, is the principal concern. I can see uh, a few uh, things uh, coming along uh, on the chat and things like that. Um, I don't, I think some people have had their uh, hand up. Uh, but I'm not sure whether actually attendees can uh, contribute verbally, I've just discovered. 
Um, so if you want to say something, uh, I've now realized that I don't, oh, allow to talk, it says. So what I can do is I can allow someone to talk. So Min has their hand up, so I'm going to allow them to talk. Uh, Min, do you want to come in? Do you have your hand raised? Just, um, there's a couple of people. I'm just going to allow a few people to talk. So Min hasn't said anything yet. So Conrad, do you want to come in? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Hine. Thank you so much. Um, my my biggest um, struggle I've had is um, the failure of the system to recognize uh, disabilities in um, and, and to support people with disabilities. Uh, I, 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 I was only late diagnosed with autism, um, with Asperger's, mm -hmm. um, and I've had uh, type 1 diabetes um, for, for 45 years. And um, my situation is not black and white. And I find that the whole system very much has a box ticking approach that decides, in yeah. my case, I would have autistic meltdowns and occasional um, verbal uh, and aggressions um, due to horrendously um, unmanageable diabetes at the time. Uh, all of these factors have been taken care yeah. of, but um, the the system so literally yeah. like it just ticks a box and where well, you shouted, you scared your children, yeah. you're an abuser, you're a monster. Yeah. But actually they don't, they, they fail to take consideration for yeah. neurological problems such as that and the lack of support that I had. Yeah, well, ever... thank you. Yeah, thank yeah, you so much sorry. for sharing that. Um, I, I, I'm just going to cut you off because yeah. in the third thank study, um, we, we will talk about that um, because there's some really interesting data on the probability of that. So, um, yeah, thank you so much for that comment. And, and we're going to come to that in study three. So thank you so much. Um, John Ritchie has their hand up. Do you want to say something? Uh, yes, good morning, uh, Dr. Ben, and thank you very much. I was a victim of, um, still am a victim of uh, domestic violence and abuse by my wife, ex-wife. Uh, and I, over many years in the night of the courts and elsewhere, this is in London, um, I reached the conclusion that, uh, first of all, men were considered guilty and yeah. they had to prove their innocence, whereas women were always considered innocent and you had to prove their guilt. Mm -hmm. And indeed, uh, allegations regarding sexual abuse, uh, a high court judge called Sir Richard Henriquez put his finger on the most salient point, and I'm quoting from him, that in these matters, i.e. sexual abuse, the police have a doctrine that declares anyone claiming he or she has been sexually abused must be believed. Mm. And has Her Enrique's noticed devastatingly that this instruction foisted upon investigators, which could be any investigator, mm. um, perverts our system of justice. And that was the police uh, documents, uh, their, how they went about between the 1980s and up until mm. 2018, when the word uh, must be believed was changed to must be investigated. Mm. Uh, but that yeah. came across uh, quite talking about the, the bias, which yes. is inherent. Yes. I think also just briefly goes back in history that certainly in England, it was a patriarchal society and one might say it still is, uh, mm. but it's switching over to a sort of matriarchal, matriarchal society, thank goodness, and involvement. But it meant that I think some people had a feeling, well, the, the, the women have had a hard, hard time over the many years, some centuries. Uh, now I will believe all they say, and uh, the men have to prove it. Uh, and I would just finish off by saying I had experience in the French courts as well as the English courts, because my ex-wife claiming she had no money or no assets, went to live in a place called Monaco. Uh, and she wrote a letter saying she was living on a hundred pounds a week there. Well, as the judge said, this is absolutely ridiculous. And so the examination of the cases took place. Mm. And I would say the French system, uh, which I would uh, suggest your good people also have a look at, is much more speedy. Mm. And they solved the contact with my children, not mm. through six or nine years of studies by various psychiatrists here in England, by placing 
under observation and controlled circumstances, mm. not my daughter and myself physically together. Yeah, well, thank you for sharing those experiences. And, and you're right in terms of, you know, the, the, the stereotypes and the system. This is what we mean by legal and administrative aggression is some of the, you know, the, the stereotype around domestic abuse of the man being the abuser and the woman being the recipient. You know, they're very pervasive and, and there is this kind of maybe automatic uh, belief that accompanies that. So thank you for thank you for uh, sharing that. I'm just going to move on just because I want to make sure we stick to time um, this morning. Um, just quickly in the Q and A, uh, the um, statistics around uh, refuges are available in Mankind Initiatives uh, facts document on their website. Um, so uh, do take a look at that. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty dire uh, situation with regards to refuge space uh, for men. Um, and Victoria uh, Holt has asked, has, has put in a comment about uh, emphasis about what services can do and they can respond and has rightly pointed out that actually a lot of it is about engagement with services in the first instance. And I, I absolutely agree. Um, and I, I, I think the important thing to recognize is that it's a kind of dynamic relationship because the more accessible and the more effective services are and appear, the more engagement they're likely to have. And I think one of the issues that's been over the years is um, that services haven't necessarily seemed appealing or helpful or useful to men and it, it's maybe put them off reaching out um, and, that, and that's something that we can seek to change but a lot of my writing has been about how we can do this on a much broader scale so um, I absolutely uh, agree with that as well. Um, I'm just going to move on to study two because this is the um, corresponding uh, quantitative data from, from that uh, call line um, over a series of several months and there were just some really interesting findings, uh, core findings from that, that I think are worth highlighting. The first is that the majority of callers, the vast majority of callers, 95% were reporting a female abuser. And I think that's something that's really important to take away because a lot of the time, the response to male victims and, and highlighting the fact that male victims exist is people saying, well, yes, but they're just being abused by other men. And actually, there's more and more data that would suggest that that's you know, not necessarily the case. And the ONS data supports that as well. At least 60 percent of men who report uh, abuse are being abused by uh, women, um, partners and, and also family members as well. Um, and uh, most identified as heterosexual, speaking to the, the need potentially of uh, you know, specialist uh, LGBT services, which we'll talk about in a few weeks time. Um, the majority were from a white background, but actually these numbers correspond with the ONS statistics about uh, ethnic distribution in the UK. So actually it would suggest that the call line was uh, accessible in a way that matches the kind of ONS uh, statistics, um, but there's discussion to be had around that. Huge range of ages. Most callers were in full-time employment. Um, and again, this is an interesting uh, kind of observation when it comes to men because uh, barriers sometimes can relate to uh, access to resources that may be means tested and often uh, the men reporting will see this in the, the data in a second in full-time employment and it might disbar them from from certain uh, resources um, and 60% reported children being in the household to you know an associated impact there uh, as well that's important to make note of. Now in terms of the abuse profile most reported psychological abuse and this was the highest reported abuse so again in terms of recognizing what it is that men might need upon calling or upon approaching a service if most of them are reporting psychological abuse they will need support with that type of abuse um, but also uh, you know many of them reporting physical jealous and controlling behavior and also financial abuse interestingly 70% almost identified the abuser as their current partner. So they were still with that partner. So that is a huge risk factor for services to be aware of. And I'll talk about how that compares to female victims in a second. Caller needs is very interesting because when we think about men and we think about those stereotypes, they're stereotypically identified as, oh, well, if men are reaching out, they want practical help. That's what I always hear. Oh, yeah, they want practical help because they're men. Well, actually, the highest need with 95% of callers was emotional support. And actually, the average call length here, 47 minutes, would suggest that they want to talk. They want to talk about what's going on. They want reassurance. They want validation. And they, they want that emotional support rather than the practical. And yeah, 90% of the callers also wanted signposting and information and referral to specific uh, organizations. But 
they do want that emotional support. And I think we need to break down that barrier of thinking that men don't need that. And crucially, in terms of call information, the call length was long, which suggests that men want to talk. So that's really important. Funding came up here as well, because half who had tried hadn't been able to get through beforehand. And also many of them didn't know what they would have done if they hadn't because the scarcity of resources. So it was either call mankind, it was either call this organization or, or, um, or uh, you know, not get any help. And all of the callers described this organization as useful, but 65% of them wouldn't have called if it wasn't anonymous. And I think that's a really important point to pick up on the anonymity, because what I wouldn't say is, okay, all services that deal with men need to be anonymous what we need to do is understand what that anonymity represents on a deeper level and that anonymity represents shame and embarrassment so the reason men wanted to remain anonymous is because they were embarrassed about calling they weren't sure whether they were being abused they talked about how it didn't sit you know they've talked about how it didn't really sit well with their idea of being a man and how can i be abused i'm, I'm a man and actually the anonymity was more about dealing with that shame and that stigma and that guilt and so what services need to be aware of is not necessarily that they have to be confidential and anonymous, because often frontline services need to gather information in order to put into place safety plans. But it's about recognising what men want from those processes and that they need to be validated and have, have their abuse kind of talked through. Um, uh, oh, sorry. So, um, yeah, conclusions again, wide range of abuse. Um, predominantly female partners or ex-partners. So again, that's something to really take away. It's not just men abusing other men. Um, and the huge risk factor is that they were still with this partner at the time of calling. There appears to maybe be barriers, particularly for GBT men, maybe for BAME groups, but it, was in, it is in line with ONS proportions of ethnic minorities. Um, and men mostly wanted support and recognition. Um, and that the anonymity and, uh, anonymity and confidentiality was crucial for callers because of shame and stereotypes. So this really hammers home this importance of providing gender inclusive services. And what we mean by that is services that understand the gendered experience that men will go through in terms of their abuse. Um, I'm just going to uh, uh, keep going because I wanna make sure that I cover everything and we stick to time, but someone has just asked what the sample size was. Um, and it's up there, it's 721 callers over a nine month period. Um, so, uh, you know, an arguably robust sample size. Um, and just quickly in, in the Q&A, uh, some people uh, agreeing with what's been said um, about being ingrained in law enforcement uh, and someone with technical uh, difficulties. So um, I'm just gonna move on to study three um, and explaining the reason for doing uh, this uh, research. Now, uh, there's a random column there that should not be there, but anyway, we'll, we'll go with it. Now, this study is constructed around the idea that we can use data in different ways. And I just wanna talk about that for a second. So if we, for example, have 100 female victims and 10 male victims presenting to a service, that is base frequency data. So we're just taking that as a hypothesis. Now, ONS statistics suggest that it's, you know, for every 100, uh, uh, there will be kind of 30 to 35, uh, for every 60, there'll be 30 to 35. So I'm just using the numbers to represent uh, nice round, even numbers that I can show this example with. But even if this was the case, so what people often do is they use this frequency to make the argument about risk. So they say that women, because there's more of them presenting, have a higher risk than men. Now that is useful information and we can shape service provision around that. We can have more female services than male services, and we can have higher provision based on those numbers. Now, the tricky thing with that is that A, it's impossible to reliably get numbers about provision. We can make guesses, and often we can use the ONS statistics, which suggests one in three are male victims. We could use police data, which suggests 20% of male victims. We could use MARAC data, which suggests that 5% are male victims. The problem is, is that often those numbers are used to dismiss male victims. So they say, okay, they don't belong. Okay, they, they, there's too, too few of them, so we're not going to support them, we're not going to provide provision. The other issue is that if we do recognise that men and male victims exist, because there are always more women presenting, any issue within that, so type of abuse or, or need, 
is going to look like women are more at risk because there's more of them. So I've seen plenty of presentations where researchers or, or, or academics or um, you know, service providers have said, well, yeah, we have 100 women and 10 men. And, you know, we have 80 women presenting with this need and only four men. So they have a greater need. We need to look behind those frequency numbers to really understand what's going on and to utilize the data fully. And what I mean by that is we're looking at probability. So say we have those same groups again, but within those groups, we can identify how many within each have that particular need or characteristic. So if we have 100 women and 80 of them have a particular need, say it's a disability because that's come up already, and within the group of 10 men, only two of them, that means that women have an 80% chance of having that risk, whereas men only have a 20% chance. So women are four times more likely to have that need than men. So that's utilizing another layer of the data in order to understand what's going on. Because if you have those same proportions, if you have uh, 80 women, and then say you have, as the slides show here, say instead you have 80 women and eight men of that group, actually, they both have the same probability of that particular issue. But if we just looked at the frequencies, men would get dismissed because it would say, right, we have 80 women and only eight men. So therefore women are higher risk. That's not necessarily the case. What it means is that within that group, if we're talking about how we can best serve victims when they present to services, actually we can see that men and women have exactly the same risk. So it needs to be accounted for. Um, so if we look at that in terms of some really large scale uh, data, um, we can see that we can use probability analysis to understand what the risks are relative to those two groups. Because if we look at the numbers here, there's out of 34 or so thousand clients, around 800 of them are men, which only constitutes only only constitutes 2.5%. So if we were looking at those, just those numbers, we would say men are always going to be outdone in terms of need. If we then look at probabilities within those groups so that we can say, OK, if I have a man or if I have a woman presenting to my service, what are they likely to need? We actually see that there are some needs that are specific to those populations. OK, so let's look at presentation to services. So the average age was 33, but men were older than women and both populations around 90 percent white. Then when we get to looking at the actual uh, specific case characteristics, we can see that there are these specific probabilities or vulnerabilities. So there were similar routes of referral, but women were more likely to be referred through MARAC. So they were more likely to meet that high risk threshold and child and youth protective services. So we can see there that there is specific a higher increased probability for women so that when they walk into a service you know they have a higher probability of being high risk and a higher probability of having child use and protection services involved um, men were more likely to report an additional vulnerability so this speaks to the comments that were made uh, earlier on about disabilities being invisible but being important well actually if we look at men and women as a group men are actually more likely to report a vulnerability, even though there's less of them overall within that group, they're more likely. So this is why this data is really, really important and really interesting, because we can say, OK, if you are a service that deals with men or deals with men and women, you, you know that when a man walks in, they have a higher probability than a woman, than a woman of having an additional vulnerability. Um, again, look at the abuser. So two thirds identified the abuser as the ex-partner, but men were more likely as a group to say that this was a current partner and to still be living with them. So again, if you have a male and a female walking into a service, we know that men are more likely to still be at risk than women by being with their partner. And if we look at reported abuse, men were more likely as a group to report physical abuse, whereas women were more likely to report sexual, and, uh, sexual abuse and harassment slash stalking. And actually there was no difference in jealous and controlling behavior. Now, we see a lot of research claims that control, coercive and controlling behavior is more frequent in uh, uh, female populations. But actually, this would suggest that when reporting to services, both of those groups have an equal probability of reporting that behavior. And in terms of outcomes and risk factors, again, we can see what people have done as in a response. So women were more likely to have called the police and have visited the GP, and men were more likely to have reported issues with drugs and alcohol. So we can see that actually, again, for services dealing with these populations, so if you're a service that deals exclusively with men, 
you know that they have a higher probability than women as a victim group to have issues with drug and alcohol abuse. And that's not really surprising due to men's uh, externalization uh, uh, processes and coping mechanisms, whereas women are more likely to report mental health issues. So we can see by using this massive data set and drilling down into probabilities rather than just the numbers, we can see that each group has a, a very varied and very specific probability uh, in terms of each outcome. Um, and then finally, if we look at, uh, sorry, one second, my slides are going a bit haywire. Um, if we look at exiting from services, again, we can learn really useful information. So 85% were no longer living with the perpetrator across both populations, but men were more likely to report doing so. So again, if you have a man reporting to your service, they're more likely to be living with their perpetrator than a woman if they were reporting to the service. Men are more likely to report ongoing contact as well, if not living together, usually because of children, legal proceedings, etc. Again, in terms of the profile of abuse, men at this point, at exit from service, were still more likely to report physical abuse and more likely to report jealous and controlling behaviour. So there are specific, uh, gender specific vulnerabilities there that we can only establish by looking past the frequencies themselves. And in terms of outcome of abuse, reduction in harm, increase in client safety and quality of life were actually all greater for women than for men. So again, if we just looked at the, the objective data, we wouldn't really even give the outcomes the time of day for men because there's so few of them. But when we look at the experiences of the few men that are within those systems and within those services, they're actually getting less from those services. We need to understand why that is. Um, finally, just very briefly touching on criminal justice outcomes. So there were no differences in reporting to the police, but women were marginally more likely to have an arrest than men. Cases were charged the majority of the time, but male perpetrators were more likely to be remanded in custody than female. And the CPS was more likely to proceed with cases involving female clients. Now, again, those outcomes would be hidden in just a frequency data. Because if you just looked at frequency data, you would say, well, more women go into the criminal justice system, more women get an arrest. Yes, but as a group, they actually have a higher probability of those things than men in terms of the, the group specific probability. So it's really, really important to look behind those large, often misleading numbers. So conclusions for this and the whole presentation, and then I'll just uh, look quickly at the questions and then we'll, we'll get uh, Liz um, on um, because she's here and ready to go. Um, so conclusions, look, upon presentation to services, men and women do share many similarities, but there are gender specific risk factors and probabilities associated with each of those groups that we need to be mindful of. And at exit from services, men appear to show less improvement and we need to understand why that is. And my guess would be is that the data for, for this data set came mostly from services that were not specifically designed with men's needs in mind. And this is exactly what this data can then go towards helping with is designing services that are gender inclusive. Um, and men appear to have, for example, more and greater ongoing risk factors than women. Um, and when they exit services. Um, but it is, no, it is worth noting all the differences were consistent but small. Um, so uh, actually, you know, looking at the bigger picture, it's possibly more of a tale of similarity than difference, but things we still need to acknowledge because they did meet significance. Um, and we've argued in these papers that a base service needs to be available to all with the option and the kind of bolt-on of informed specific service provision where needed. Um, and the general conclusions from my segment are that research is enabling us to understand more about men's experiences and more and more evidence is there to suggest that maybe domestic violence isn't what I would term a gendered crime, but a crime heavily coloured by gender. And we need to look at all layers of what that statement means rather than simply there's more women approaching services than men. And policy and provision must recognise the unique risks and needs of victims and clients. Um, I just acknowledge my uh, colleagues and research assistants and uh, the organisations who took part and provided data as well. Um, if anybody has any questions beyond this seminar, this is my email and my Twitter handle. Um, so if you if you want to, please do email. Um, and what I'll do is I'll just have a quick look um, at the chat um, and the questions. Um, yeah, so John's talked about um, stereotypes of masculinity should be used uh, uh, carefully because it implies something's wrong with masculinity rather than how masculinity is viewed by others. Yeah, I totally agree with that. 
Um, but we do need to understand how masculinity at all levels shapes experience and also coping, et cetera, and things like that. Um, and, and I've spoken very freely about how we need to start talking about masculinity, um, you know, in a much more constructive way. Um, there wasn't any gambling stats, um, unfortunately, but uh, yeah, I think that would be really interesting to look at. Um, and I will follow up with the charities that I work with about that as well. So that's a really good question, Maria. Um, um, and yeah, there's a really good question here about sexual abuse. Uh, maybe men aren't reporting based on the way it's defined in law. And I think that's a really good comment because we know that lots of the laws are not gender neutral. Um, so it may be that men are reporting less sexual abuse because they don't feel they've been uh, sexually abused. And Siobhan Weir uh, at, uh, at uh, Lancashire is doing some really good work on force to penetrate and we'll maybe get her along to do a seminar um, as well. OK. I'm going to hand it over uh, now to uh, Liz, um, but thank you all very much for listening to my uh, segment. And I know we're running a little bit over time. Um, so uh, yeah, hopefully we'll make up that, that at the end. Um, so I'll stop sharing my screen and Liz is ready to go. So I'm gonna hand over to her. So thank you so much for being with us, Liz. Couldn't unmute then. Thank you so much for having me. Um, let me just check that I can. Can you see that? Yeah, so we can see and hear you. So uh, yeah. brilliant, thank you. Um, okay, so firstly, apologies. I'm um, on campus today, which is very exciting, and I've just nicked a room to be able to do this in. But it's the, the one they've given me is massive, so very echoey. So I apologise. Um, so. My name's Liz, I'm from the University of Cumbria. Um, I'm going to be talking a little bit today about my research, um, well, research that I've done with some colleagues, Julie um, Taylor at Cumbria and Ben, obviously, that you've just been hearing from. So I'm just going to chat through a little bit to do with how post-separation abuse, um, so abuse, the ways in which abuse can continue and change post-separation, and then very much the ways in which this can impact on fathers as well. Um, so I'm just going to very briefly discuss about what we know about men's experiences. Um, I again, I really apologise that I came in late, so I don't actually know what Ben described around this area. So if I do repeat anything that's been said, I apologise. Um, and then, as I said, just look a little bit about how um, abuse can continue and change after the end of the relationship. So I'm just giving my other time. Um, so again, you may have heard this already, um, but some of the research that we are aware of now around men's experiences of domestic violence has started to really accrue over the last, it is over the last 50 years, um, so some of Mary Strauss's early work was back in sort of the 70s and 80s, but actually the more focused exploration of men's experiences has been only since sort of 2007 and the work that Denise Hines did, so we're still in the infancy compared to the wider body of literature that we've got. We do know that men experience domestic violence, and as Ben may have mentioned, we know that it contrasts some of the um, models that exist around um, the influence of gender within domestic violence. So some of those gendered and patriarchal models that say men hit women, men abuse women, um, and that when women are violent, it's in self-defense. A lot of the research that we have now really contradicts that in terms of men's experiences, but also obviously wider experiences within the LGBTQ plus community as well. So we know from um, some of the development of act-based measures, so where we move away from looking at um, police data or, or um, sort of uh, people in prisons and in shelters and things, um, we know that when you ask people about what happens in their relationship, that actually men and women are um, abusive in relationships and people that don't identify in that way as well. Well, and the development of things like the conflict tactic scales really highlighted that. And as I say, over the last 15 years, we've then sort of really started to explore how that can impact in terms of, you know, very focused exploration of men's experiences. So we know that men experience physical abuse. We know that they're attacked with weapons, that um, they're often attacked when they're vulnerable. So when they're asleep or when they're in the shower and things like that. Um, some of the work that Siobhan Weir has done also demonstrates that we know that they experience sexual abuse within that relationship and sexual abuse from women as well. So again, that's one of the, the biggest taboos I think that still exists around this area. And we know they experience that psychological and emotional abuse, that there are different types of abuse they can experience that are potentially more um, gender specific. So things like legal and administrative aggression, for example. And we know that it has really significant physical and mental health outcomes for men. And this, is that, this has been through exploring with men those experiences but also more recently and obviously what you've just been hearing about when we look at sort of practitioners working with men as well what's less understood um specifically for men but even i would say within um, 
some of the women's literature as well is um, the impact and the uh, what, what post-separation abuse can look like. So we know through the women's literature um, that there is evidence of continued abuse and harassment of women after the end of a relationship by their partners. And we know that that particular time just after the end of a relationship can be particularly dangerous for women because that is carries an escalation, a risk, sorry, of escalation to homicide. So we know that there is abuse and harassment after the end of a relationship when we've worked with women. We know from literature that's explored, obviously, custody disputes and divorce, the ways in which um, the proceedings can be uh, manipulated, the ways in which parents can manipulate. We then know a little bit through um, some of the literature, and I'll come back to this about parental alienation and the way in which the relationship between, par uh, between a parent and a child sorry, can be manipulated. And we also know from the body of literature that there is an impact on, well, we, we already knew there was an impact on children, sorry. Um, but I think more recently we've started to explore children's experiences, both at the time and retrospectively, to really understand actually the ways in which exposure to domestic violence can impact on children. One of the things that historically we have done within this field is construct children who are not directly abused, so just just <laughs> so children that are living in the home where there's abuse between the parents are witnesses hope you can see me doing this um, whereas actually children um, the when we construct it more is actually the fact children are victims within that home and we can start to kind of explore the ways we can support them as well so what do we know about men well from some of the canadian social survey data that's 20 years old now and um, we know that men and women um, experience violence after the end for relationships so 40 percent of men and 20 uh, women sorry and 20, 32 percent of men have reported some violence after the end of the relationship and for some this was um only started after the end of the relationship and for some it had escalated as well so we know that violence can occur after the end of a relationship for men when you look at figures that look at domestic stalking by a partner or an ex-partner we see that one in every four victims of stalking of this type is male so for every four victims, three will be female and one will be male. We also know when we look specifically at men's experiences of stalking that 32% of those perpetrators are current or ex-partners since the age of 16 and that for women it's 45%. So again, we know that there, is, there are not disproportionately different figures here. But there hadn't been until recently a direct exploration really of actually how this abuse can continue and change for um, men post separation. So some of the work that I've done um, looking at men's experiences using sort of larger scale qualitative um, questionnaires, one of the things that had really come up for me was this post separation abuse. So the way in which people, uh, men within the survey that I, um, I did, kept referring to the fact that after the end it got worse or after the end she still did this or after the end this happened. So in a follow-up study um, with people who were willing to take part, um, I did some interviews um, with men and I specifically asked about this post-separation experience. So what is it and how is it that it changed after the end of a relationship? And within this study, there were um, 13 men. Um, all of them said that the physical violence had stopped, but all of them said that the, the coercive control and the ways in which that sort of emotional and psychological abuse had continued. So Julie um, and myself, as well as two of our fantastic research assistants. Um, we decided to utilize that original sort of qualitative anonymous online survey to really facilitate men's disclosure. We decided to utilize that and, and target exploring post-separation abuse. So for this 130 men that took part, um, these are the themes that came out. And I'm not obviously gonna discuss all of these today. But we saw pre-separation abuse, so we saw that there was obviously physical violence, sexual violence, that control and emotional abuse as well. It was very much the context of um, the majority, I would say, of men's experiences. So where there was post-separation abuse, there had been pre-separation abuse, but there was a small proportion where there wasn't. So there was a small proportion where it only actually started after the end of the relationship. We then obviously looked at post-separation abuse in specifically, and there were descriptions of physical violence, continued um, control and harassment, and manipulation of the children. The impact of those experiences and the help seeking as well. So the impact of these experiences, you can see here, I'm gonna include a few quotes with, so I'll just move the slide on now. So on this slide, you can see there are some examples of the ways in which um, they described physical violence, the way they described the sort of exertion of control. So as you can see from those first two quotes, it's significant physical violence that we're talking about here. So injurious, definitely had the potential to injure. 
Um, the coercive control was also really seen for, so it could either be through things like harassment, as you can see from that bottom quote, where there was stalking type and harassment type behaviours, or within that third quote there that you can see, it was the threat of um, legal and administrative aggression, so that, well, the threat of false allegations, the threat of being able to manipulate a system to have something happen to him, so that threat of controlling him again through the use of systems. And the impact of this abuse was really significant and a kind of the way in which they talked about it within it was really significant because I suppose the goal of trying to escape a violent relationship and an abusive relationship is to get away from that. And so to actually have managed to get away from that and then for that to still be continuing and still be impacting has such significant particular mental health impacts for men. So they were talking about being scared. They were talking about the suicidal ideation and attempts. And um, they talked about the impact with children as well, which I'm going to come on to in a minute with the work I've done with Ben. Um, and there was also a real impact on the extended family, which I feel, you know, stupid in hindsight for not really considering. Considering, but a lot of the men talked about how it impacted them and the children, but also actually how it impacted on wider extended family. So there were two sort of key elements to this. One was the way in which it was impacting on their extended family, i.e. when they weren't seeing their children, this was impacting on their, the, the child's grandparents and uncles and cousins and other people within that family that were the, no longer getting to see them. But also children that were involved within that relationship that weren't biologically his. So where men would talk about actually the fact that they were missing their stepkids, they'd been involved within their lives for a really long time, but that actually because of they'd separated and they have no legal rights around them, that they were really missing that relationship as well. So parental alienation. Parental alienation is a really contentious term, and I'm always really nervous about using it in some ways but I know that it's the term that is used in the wider field and we, people would recognize it when I talk about the behavior that's involved so it's a term that was coined by Gardner back in 2002 and ultimately what it is is it involves one parent manipulating and damaging a child's relationship with the other what we call target parent so for the work that I'm doing I'm talking about the ways in which mothers can manipulate and damage the relationship with fathers because that's where I work but obviously it happens the other way around as well the evidence around this concept is really mixed, and I think that that is partly to do with um, the fact that a lot of it is anecdotal, and um, partly to do with the fact that there is not a, a body of rigorous methodological, methodologically speaking, um, research out there on this topic at the moment. And one of the systematic reviews by Harm and that reference there that was done really points to this as an issue within the area. It's not seen as something that we widely understand because it's not clear if we're always talking about the same thing. And actually, the lack of acknowledgement and acceptance of it means that we, we probably aren't always necessarily talking about the same thing. But um, the tactics could include what I sort of loosely separate into direct and indirect means. So directly targeting and, and sorry, directly manipulating through, for example, putting the parent down and um, denigrating humiliation, undermining them and um, lying or manipulating that relationship or indirectly. So, for example, through false allegations, which will impact then on child contact or through breaching court orders as well. Ultimately, what we have within this, I think, is an extension from the post separation angle is this is a way in which fathers can be controlled after the end of a relationship. So within the data um, that Ben and I have, we did again an anonymous online survey. Um, and whilst I recognise that there are obviously limitations with using a method like that, it also really facilitates um, men being able to disclose. We know there were really significant barriers to men disclosing their experience. And this was one way in which we could really try and capture a broader range of experience. So we saw within this that there was the manipulation of the, child's, of the relationship with the child. So for some men, they hadn't seen their children for a number of years. Um, for some, the sort of manipulation, the, the start of the alienation had occurred before the end of the relationship. So for some, they were saying that the mother had said, you know, dad stays at work because he doesn't want to spend time with you. He's out with his friends because he doesn't really love you. Um, and so actually sort of manipulating that at the end, before the end of that relationship. And this could also be seen through the child and the child's accounts. Obviously, I've only spoken with the men, so we, you know, I'm, I'm reflect, I'm recognise that obviously they're describing the child's experiences. Um, but for some, the fathers were describing the way in which the child was taking responsibility for the mother and being worried about leaving her because she cries when I'm not there or she's upset when I'm not there. So the ways in which that really impacted on the children. 
And these are some examples of some of the alienating behaviours as well. So we saw alienation um, very physically and geographically through the fact that children had been taken away from the um, from the father so geographically had moved quite far away sometimes not disclosing the location so they were, didn't even know where they were and um, sometimes it was through manipulation of that agreed contact so where it was his time and um, she would arrange things for them to do so that he didn't actually have as much time with them for others it was about disobeying and breaching court orders and it was really clear within the accounts of these men that they felt there was no penalty and there was no recompense to this happening. So women, in as again, just to be clear, in this data, the women were breaking these and breaching these court orders and nothing was being done about it. So there was no deterrent to not do it. Um, and then other ways were in the sort of, you know, the really subtle sort of ways. So not so sort of calling, um, for example, calling him his name, not dad or whatever in front of the children, then actually getting the children not to call him dad and calling another man dad. So this was all these sort of ways in which we could see that that relationship was being affected. And again, the impact was really, really significant. The impact in, in both the data, my original data set, my post-separation data, all of it, the most impactful thing for any men within those data sets who were fathers is the impact around the relationship with their children. And this was really obvious, all of it was seen within this data. They were so, so impacted by it. They talked about the mental health outcomes and the, as, as you can see here, the sort of suicide ideation and attempts, um, the, the depression, the anxiety, the sort of trauma-based symptoms. And also, I think sometimes that not many of them use the word grief, but it's it, grief was a theme. It was a real theme because they were talking about mourning the loss of a relationship with somebody who was still alive. But it was like a grief because they, they never got to see them. So the impact was really, really significant. And again, I, I only we only worked with the men. We only have the men's accounts. But we did ask about what was the perception of the impact that it had on the children. And so their perception was through either accounts of grandparents, for example, that um, that it was impacting them significantly in terms of things like emotional and psychological harm, um, in terms of things like perhaps behavioural problems or, or schoolwork and things like that. Um, and for some, they talked about the perception that it had really impacted on their childhood. And I suppose I link that back to that quote before, where the child was carrying the responsibility of making ensure mum was okay so I can't come and see your dad because I don't think mum's okay and a child carrying that responsibility and almost having to grow up too soon I suppose so there was a real theme um, around this in terms of their, their accounts. So I suppose again Ben has probably talked a little bit about this but one of the ways in which um, I think that this research can really impact is around it points to the fact that we have men and women, people who don't identify in that way. We have people within the LGBTQ plus community, so people in same sex relationships. Like it doesn't matter the gender identity or sexual orientation of somebody. These behaviours can exist. There is abusive behaviours. There is physical and emotional abuse. There are ways in which we can um, continue this after the end of the relationship. There are ways in which this can impact on the parental relationship, regardless of these issues but we still carry within the UK policies and legislation that are very gender focused. And I know that that is you know, a contentious discussion in and of itself. But one of the um, papers I did last year with Emily Douglas in America was we reviewed UK and US services generally. Um, and we looked at specifically what we called underserved populations. So again, men, LGBTQ plus children and things like that. And our conclusion that I'll come back to in a number of times of papers since then is really about the fact that we need a policy and legislation that is inclusive in both name and spirit. So we need to have guidance that is inclusive, guidance that is encouraging inclusivity and really broaden out how we work with this to try and sort of have it more informed by evidence. And I think that once we can do that, we can hopefully start to sort of tackle some of these issues. Um, so I think I've actually whizzed through that, but I think Ben might be happy I've clawed a little bit of time back for him. Um, my contact details are here. So this is my email address and my Twitter. Um, I'm happy to take a couple of questions now, if, if that's okay, Ben, because I'm afraid I'm not able to stay till the end. I'm, I'm really sorry. So if anybody does have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Or if it's better just to carry on, I'm happy to take them over email as well. But thank you so Thanks. much for listening. Thanks so much, Liz. Um... And yeah, thank you for uh, clawing some time back. That's really, really useful. Um, and yeah, if you want to type questions into the Q&A, 
um, the panelists can uh, see those questions and kind of answer them um, in time. Uh, otherwise, I've got to kind of unmute people and allow them to talk and all, it gets a bit messy. Um, but uh, what I forgot to do at the start was kind of introduce uh, Liz. Um, and I mean, the way I would always do that is to say that she's, you know, arguably the UK's leading expert on male victims of IPV, um, widely published in the area and a, and a fantastic research colleague. And um, I'm really enjoying the work that we're doing that's bringing together uh, IPV and, you know, quote unquote, parental alienation, um, you know, and, and this kind of increasing recognition that actually uh, PA seems to almost operate as a function and an avenue of IPV, which is a really interesting thing to look at. So, uh, yeah, thank you so much for coming on and, and speaking, uh, Liz. Um, so uh, John has asked the question. Thanks, Liz. Can you say a bit more about what services need to do to be supportive in word and spirit? Um, I think I know what you mean, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Um, so the idea of, in, I suppose the idea of inclusivity really is for me that it's something that it provides equal opportunity to everybody to get the access to help and support. Um, so where we have, I suppose the name and spirit bit comes from the fact that Obviously, we have a gender neutral definition of domestic violence, but we know that um, despite that, there are still gendered approaches to um, working with domestic violence perpetrators and victims, which means that even though there is, the, you know, the words are there to say that it supports everybody, that the approach is not always there to support it. And so the spirit bit, the name and spirit, I suppose, comes really from out. I, I would love to see more. Um, what's the word? A stronger, I suppose, a stronger enthusiasm, appetite, whatever the word is, generally speaking, from the sector to want to support people. And that's, again, I know that's probably a contentious thing in and of itself to say, because I'm, I'm certainly not implying that anybody isn't. But I do know that there are areas where it is really difficult for men and people within the LGBTQ plus community to get support. And I would just really like it so that it was anybody could get access, you know, because there's vulnerability and there's trauma associated with these experiences and the thought that somebody is in that moment and can't get access to help and support I just think is not okay in this day and age. Yeah that, and, and I think what we've been looking at Liz and, and stating in all of our papers is um, you know trying to get to a position where we have that base service available to everybody that has an awareness and a kind of almost bolt on of the gender specific or sexuality specific or class specific or race specific issues that will be involving that population. So um, yeah, that's that's what we want to see. Um, and comrades asked, uh, have you presented this data to the Home Office, Ministry of Justice, Government and Opposition Parties? And if so, what has their response been? E.g. are they going to refocus funding to apply it proportionately? Um, I, ha I have presented it wherever I've been allowed to, shall we yeah. say. So I, any any available opportunity I've had to try and communicate with people that make decisions about this sort of thing, I always have done. Um, they are not always that present, unfortunately, um, in terms of opportunities. Like what, And this is, again, wider, again, not directed to any specific agency. Broadly speaking, um, I'm aware that some people don't want to listen. And again, that's not criticising anybody in particular at all um but i do i certainly take up every opportunity because that's important and it's something ben and i talk about that so it's really good to publish papers it's really important yeah. so it's my job i need to do that but actually the people that really need to read it and understand it are people like you coming to seminars like this as a whole um, and yeah. so i'm really pleased to have been invited to talk today and i'm really pleased if anybody's found this helpful and interesting and i can and see from the chat that somebody is from the moj here so i'm really yeah. pleased i can say yes i have presented to the <laughs> moj <laughs> Yeah, I was just about to say someone has just said that they're from the MOJ and welcome to, to that individual and thank you so much for joining and this is what Ebdan and the seminars are about, is about bringing together all different groups and types of people from the general public through to people who work in the systems and the policy makers um, to kind of present the research and, and that's, that's what Liz and I are fundamentally interested in and the other members of the network is getting the research, providing the research to people who are willing to listen and getting the evidence base there and that's particularly the case in parental alienation um, because as Liz highlighted it look it has had a bit of a rocky road evidentially and we're not going to deny that 
Um, but what we're trying to do is provide good, robust, empirically sound data to kind of build uh, the evidence base with people like Jen Harmon in America and, and kind of highlight it to, to people who, who need to hear it. So, um, yeah, thanks for your uh, answer on that, Liz. Um, there's just a few uh, questions. I think I'll just take a couple more. Um, I'll just have a read of them. Um, Oh, so there's someone here who says, I've been tasked with developing the first male victim support program within our charity. This seminar has been incredibly helpful, but are there key elements that you feel are paramount to include within programs? So I guess that's kind of a... <laughs> Liz, do another talk on that. Yeah, do another talk. But I guess, Liz, if I could rephrase the question and say to you, what is the one thing, and we can follow up with this person if they want to email us, we're more than happy to consult with, with charities and organisations. But if you were to, to say, what's the one thing that you would say to this person that they need to consider when setting up their service, what would that be? Um, I know, I would that's say, really difficult. <laughs> it's probably split it into two slightly. I would okay. say that um, ask and believe. Now that, sound, that sounds like a really cheesy thing to say. Um, men are not often asked about it in the way that we ask women about these experiences. So I suppose it depends on obviously where, where what agency it is. So forgive me if this isn't relevant. So for example, like in hospitals or in, you know, like police officers, you know, I would always say if you suspect anything, ask the question because asking the question can sometimes be the way in which for men and for women but particularly for men because they don't have that opportunity to disclose necessarily and they're certainly not screened like in hospitals if a woman is um turns up with injury she will be asked about it we don't do that with men and men are at risk of violence and aggression in other ways outside of relationships so i understand that so we say ask the question um, and i think that one of the things that they are most frightened of is not being believed so i would say any any culture or any approach that can um, encourage that so again slightly contentiously and then I'm going to disappear so I don't have to see the response but I'm really not comfortable with screening or assessment procedures personally um, because we either should do it for everybody off and over day and personally I don't I understand that we need to sometimes assess to work out what the best course of action is but at the moment there are services that screen and assess men but not women and I don't think that's okay and as soon as a man feels he's being assessed sorry then he will feel he's not being believed and I think that belief is such an important thing to get across straight away so that they have then that courage and that um, validation I suppose is probably a better word to then be able to talk more and disclose more so and um, ask questions and believe encourage that culture of belief yeah I think that's a really great answer to a, to a tricky question um, and that's everything that we've seen from the research that we've done and that I've done with with the case reviews and the caller data is, you know, men, if they're, if they're reaching out, they're not usually doing so with the definitive belief that they are even a victim. They're doing so to test the water and to understand what's going on yes. with them. And you need to, 100%. organizations need to respond to that and go, okay, I've listened to what you've said. I validate your experiences. And I, I, I you know, we do believe you. And I think that's absolutely uh, right. So I'm, I'm just going to, there are some other questions. I'm just going to bring Paul in here because I want to make sure that he has time to, to speak. But I want to thank Liz so much for talking about her always excellent research. And uh, yeah, thank you so much for, for, for being here. And thank you so I've, much. I've stressed this in the comments. The slides will be made available. We'll get those together and we'll send them out as a pack uh, later on. But thank you so much, Liz. Thank you. And please do email or get in touch on Twitter or anything if you'd like to chat more. Um, enjoy. So sorry, I can't see your talk, Paul. I'm really good. I'm missing it. But thank you so much. I'll see you soon. Right. I'm going to bring in um, Paul now, um, who uh, works for uh, family needs, uh, family, Families Need Fathers, uh, Both Parents Matters, Cymru, which is an organisation in uh, Wales, which supports uh, uh fathers and men going through uh family breakdown um and he's going to talk about um what it's like running that service the challenges and what he would like people to know about running that service and what the challenges are so thank you so much paul for joining us and i'm going to hand over to you for your for your presentation brilliant thanks ben um it's been fascinating listening to you and to liz um, huge respect for what you do. Um, I'm not an academic. Um, I'm just a poor chap who's the national manager for the charity that you've just mentioned. Um, and I got into this, crikey, it must have been, I've been doing this for over 10 years. Um, but I tell you what, let me, let me try and see if I can share 
Uh, now, how do I do that? Can I share? There should be a, on the Zoom interface, there should be a green share screen button um, somewhere. Ah, yep, yeah, I'm with you. Okay, hang on, bear with me. And then you should be able to choose the window that you want to share and... and uh... Okay. So is that, is that working? Yes, so we can see that and we can hear you. If you want to uh, make it full screen yeah. uh, as, as a slideshow, then we'll, then we'll see it as a full screen. Uh, yeah. There we are. That's fab. Okay, so um, my name's Paul Aprida. I'm the national manager of uh, both Parents Matter. I'm the IDVA for our specialist domestic violence support service branded with a different name called Aegis. Um, I can assure you there are many people who can butcher the, uh, the name Aegis and uh, I'm probably one of them as well. Um, uh, thank you for, for getting me to talk about um, uh, what we do. Um, our service, really, we, we, we started off um, well, more than 10 years ago, um, and the service has evolved and grown. Um, and that's why we now deliver two services within the one charity uh, banner. Let me see if I can. Right. So who we are, we're a registered charity formed in 2009. Um, we've got a number of uh, trustees. Um, in fact, I think at least one of them is in the audience. Um, and obviously, uh, we are, we're funded currently by um, Tudor Trust, where we have some funding for a thing called the Buddy Scheme. And I noticed in, um, I think particularly in Ben's presentation, a need for emotional support. And that was something that we identified. And so we sought some funding for that. Um, to deliver the buddy scheme as a way to um, really to help men specifically, I'm going to use a slightly controversial term, stay in the game. Because in my experience, one of the, 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 the worst scenarios for men is that they face massive structural difficulties and then they simply give up because there is no support. Um, or what support is there um, is inadequate. So we felt that having an emotional support scheme was really important. And I'm delighted to say we've just uh, received confirmation that we are um, just starting um, a three-year uh, funding package from the National Lottery for um, essentially for both of our services. So what we do, um, well, there's slightly different legislation in Wales. So um, we have a thing called the Social Services and Wellbeing Wales Act um, that defines services. So we are a, an information advice and assistance service. I know a lot of services say that they don't give advice. Um, we do give advice and we have professional indemnity insurance to do that. So we provide support to parents and grandparents. Um, and we do that primarily, I think, through our legal advice clinic, um, which is under the um, Law Works uh, banner. So Law Works is a charity. It, it's effectively the, the solicitor's pro bono um, charity. I've mentioned the buddy scheme, and it's probably about three years ago that we were noticing that domestic violence and abuse was being raised um, by really the majority of our service users, that they were experiencing um, patterns of either physical abuse or um, controlling behavior. Um, so we decided to create a specialist domestic violence support service exclusively for men. Um, now, some people might say, and, I, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm conscious that this might be slightly controversial, so um, please bear with me. Um, our 
um, both Parents Matter service is, uh, it attempts to be inclusive. I hope that it is inclusive in that we support uh, anyone who is being excluded from the lives of their children. Our Aegis Specialist Domestic Violence Support Service is exclusively for men. And it is exclusively for men because we felt that um, we were not best placed to provide a service for women um, and that we saw a, um, a gap in provision of services for men. So that was one factor. The other factor was that um, we feel that services for men and women should be safely separated one from another um, and that those services should be delivered by organisations grounded in the experience of their service users. Um, I think, um, again, forgive me being slightly controversial, um, I, I recall a meeting with the lead uh, for domestic violence and abuse in Welsh government, who I asked, um, who, who was it who had determined that in supporting male victims of domestic violence and abuse, a women's aid organisation was the best man for the job? Um, and I appreciate that's tremendously controversial, but um, that's how we see it. So it's not about denying the experience of women. It's about providing men with a safe space, with a service that is targeted at supporting men. So how do we do it? So we have a helpline, which is volunteer run, Monday to Friday, 10 a.m. to 7 p.m. Uh, we have a website uh, for self-referral for help and support. Um, we receive professional referrals, so um, the largest group of those are from solicitors. We also regularly get uh, citizens' advice. We've had a, a, a spate recently from probation, thinking about others we've had from YMCA, other th third sector groups, etc. And professional introductions and referrals amount for just over 20% of cases in the past 12 months. Now, when I looked at our data management system, I was slightly surprised that it was only 20%, but hey, that's, that's what our data is telling us. And what we do, and I, I, was, I was very interested with Ben's presentation about another um, specialist domestic violence support service for men and their data um, saying that men wanted anonymity. Um, our experience is, poles apart from that um, and what we do is with each service user we complete a six page service user pack so we're currently in version 2.0 um, but we're about to uh, finalize version 2.1 um, each element tries to capture a different um, specific um, area of information. So we have a confidentiality and data protection statement, um, which we read to individual service users and ask them for their consent. Um, we've also, having discussed this with some mental health charities, um, we now ask for an emergency contact. So if we couldn't get hold of the service user, then, uh, you know, was there somebody else that we could contact? And we also get details of their GP surgery, which has come in helpful on, I'm sad to say, a couple of occasions. The next element um, we call about you. So we ask for um, information like your name, your email address, your phone number, your date of birth. We also ask about um, uh, disability. We ask about ethnicity. And we ask about um, whether an individual is here in receipt of benefits. What we're looking for there is specifically universal credit, but I'll come back to that um, and, and why we ask for that information. We then move to a, a section which, which is called how can we help? And we split that into three sections. What is the problem? 
what is the solution and what actions need to be taken. Now, we managed to somehow achieve all of that on one side of A4, which is a constant surprise to me. Um, sometimes I'm afraid we do have to expand the boxes so we do get a little bit um, further on. Then with everyone who approaches us, we complete a modified version of the Safe Lives Domestic Violence Risk Indicator Checklist. Um, those who know uh, will know that question nine in the uh, standard version would ask, um, uh, are you pregnant or have you given birth in the last 18 months? As a service exclusively for men, we felt that that probably wasn't terribly productive as a question. So we now ask whether they, um, the individual has had a child in the past 18 months. We then uh, wrap up by um, completing the short Warwick Edinburgh Mental Wellbeing Scale and the De Jong Geervald Loneliness Scale. Those two measures were chosen because they are uh, measures of well-being set out in a, a piece of Welsh legislation called the, the Well-Being of Future Generations Act um, and the Welsh Government report on the well-being of Wales each year and we thought we might as well use the same uh, data. So how much do we do? Um, in the past 12 months, we created just over 500 new discrete cases on our secure data management platform. Um, now, we use a platform called Caseworker, and it is the uh, platform used by members of parliament and members of the Welsh parliament. And when I looked on Caseworker, I spotted that of our 500 cases, 52 were in England, but you can see the majority of our service users are in Wales. Now, 64% of cases were identified as legal aid. So we, we um, when we create a case, we set up um, kind of tags. So I'm pulling data from the tags that we've uh, put on. Um, and then 25% related to private law, um, where legal aid is not available. So with, with a case, we will identify it as being legal aid if an individual um, is uh, in receipt of universal credit or has a low income indicated to us by answering a question, is your income below 12,000 pounds a year? So um, now the, the uh, it, it, I just want to digress for, for a, a moment about legal aid. So th there is a perception that legal aid is not available. Um, I, I mean legal aid specifically in relation to family proceedings. Um, and um, how can I phrase this? Um, that, that is a myth, um, which uh, I hope we are uh, playing some role in unpicking. Um, so legal aid is available if you meet the financial criteria, you meet the merit test, and you also have qualifying evidence uh, in relation to domestic violence and abuse. You don't have to have evidence that you are a victim of domestic violence. The legislation requires evidence in, a in, in one of many prescribed forms if you are or are at risk of domestic violence and abuse. And the person um, uh, that you are at risk from would have to be the other party in proceedings. So uh, we issue something over 220 legal aid evidence letters each year to solicitors in England and Wales. Um, so what do our service users want or need? Well, um, to see their children, uh, to be protected from false allegations of abuse, to feel that they are not alone. Now that's not everybody. Some people, you know, don't want to engage in our, for example, we run a, 
uh, an online support meeting on a Wednesday evening. Some people don't wish to participate in that because they don't want to share information about their, their own uh, situation. Um, but people tend to approach us because they want practical help in overcoming abuse and finding ways to have a relationship with the children that they care about. They also approach us because they are aware of what we can do in relation to legal aid and they want effective representation in the family court. So in terms of identifying the issues that, that our service users um, uh, have uh, basically face, um, it's being believed and taken seriously by statutory and third sector providers. Um, we undertook a survey a few years ago called Understanding Men with 728 responses. And you can see there the, the kind of the percentages that we're dealing with. Um, I think somebody's touched on already about the, the importance of being believed and also of, I think Liz um, ducked out while being um, controversial around screening and assessing. So um, we raised, in fact, one of our trustees, let's get it right. One of our trustees, couldn't possibly say which one, but they might be in this call, um, uh, raised uh, with the Equality and Human Rights Commission, the uh, practice of services uh, screening or assessing men and not doing the same for women. Now, the Equality and Human Rights Commission um, initially responded by saying that it was entirely lawful um, and appropriate uh, to screen men and not women because uh, statistics said that the majority of victims were women and the majority of perpetrators were men. Now, um, we thought that probably wasn't right. Um, and we asked them to think about that uh, again and we were very uh, fortunate to be assisted by uh, a, a member of the Welsh Parliament who um, raised those questions directly with the Equality and Human Rights Commission. And after some persuasion, um, they commissioned independent legal advice, which said that it was unlawful for a service to screen or assess men and not apply the same uh, to women. It was a specific breach of the Equality Acts 2010, I think it's section 146. Um, and it was therefore, it was direct discrimination and unlawful. Um, helpfully, um, the, uh, the position that the Equality and Human Rights Commission uh, put forward said that if a service was exclusively, was gender uh, exclusive, not inclusive, then it could continue to carry on screening and assessing the, um, in the circumstance, the men who were approaching it uh, because there was not a comparator group um, for another group who shared a protected characteristic, i.e. sex. So if you're a single sex service, you can screen and assess. If you're not a single sex service, it is unlawful to do so. Um, now, from, from that survey, um, that's the 728, um, men tell us a range of, of things, um, which I think are, are, are quite familiar and quite consistent um, with some of the other data that we've seen. Um, is, uh, false allegations. Um, it actually surprised me when I was looking at the data and when I was thinking about this um, presentation, uh, it surprised me the relatively high levels of physical abuse and often quite serious physical abuse that men experience. Now, I thought it might help if um, I talk about some of the individual cases. Now, obviously, there are all manner of uh, issues about confidentiality. Um, so 
um, I'm going to come to case study number one, who is Cledwin. Now, it's a good traditional Welsh name. Um, and I, I think it's fairly clear to everybody that Cledwin is not his real name. So um, Cledwin is, um, well, I'm going to say he's mid 30s. It, it, it might be a slight stretch, but anyway. So he's a dad with two um, junior school aged boys. Mum is registered blind and dad was her carer. Um, there was an incident uh, in April of last year uh, in which mum came back to the house with her stepbrother and two of his friends and made credible threats to kill against Cledwin, um, forcing him to flee the house. Um, I think one of his boys actually saw the incident. The other child was upstairs at the time. Um, <clears throat> having left the property, he dialed 999. Um, and the police response was not, not entirely what he'd hoped for. Um, uh, police attended and uh, threatened him that they would, quote, spark him out if he started to cry. Um, they noticed that he was driving a motability car uh, and one of the officers stated to the other, that's a nice car. Yeah, that's what you get for doing fuck all. Um, so th there was a, a bit of a difficulty right from the start in his relationship um, with, with the police. So he approached us, our charity completed a service user pack and Cledwin scored 18 on the DV risk indicator checklist. So I made a MARAC referral um, and he was accepted into, he was accepted as a high risk victim of domestic abuse uh, in the local MARAC to the area that he'd fled. Um, now, over the following weeks, mum couldn't cope with the children, so allowed dad to pick them up um, for a few days. And I have to say, at that point, I advised him to keep the children in his care and to immediately make an application to the family court. Um, now, what subsequently uh, took place was that. Um, a member of the Marac divulged his address to uh, the mum uh, and she got a friend to drive her to his house and confront him and insist on the children being returned. He dialed 999 and the police attended within five minutes. They spoke to the children who confirmed that they wanted to stay with dad. Uh, then the officers asked mum and dad what the issues were, and mum said that he'd taken the children from her. Um, officers then pressured Cledwin to agree to return the children to mum, even though he stated that he'd made an application to the family court. When he did that, an officer said, oh, let me tell you, that's pointless. Fathers never get to be the main carers. The officers then pressured Cledwin to agree that he'd take the children back to mum for the weekend. He did so and then didn't see the boys for the next four months until a court hearing. Now, there's a lot more that I could talk about with Cledwin's case, but moving on, um, you'll see I've gone for traditional fine Welsh names. Um, now, I'm going to pronounce that. But I've got to make sure my, 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 uh, my mouth is clear to start. So case note study number two is Rheinast. Um, unsurprising, that's not his real name either. Uh, he's a man in his mid-40s. He has two boys with a five-year age gap between them. The eldest is now 15. Separated eight years ago, uh, mum fled to a refuge, um, taking the two boys with her. Um, eventually, uh, some form of contact was restored. 
um, there was an initial proceedings in the family court. Um, ultimately, those broke down. So a couple of years later, there were further proceedings. Cool. And Sorry, just just to say about there's probably about five minutes left because you just yeah. want to have a few time for question at the end. Thank Absolutely. you. Absolutely, no problem. So, um, uh, so fled fled to sorry the the the, the uh, new proceedings gave him uh, overnight contact once a month because there was a significant distance between uh, him and mum. Uh, now that's carried on, but with the onset of COVID, he agreed to suspend face-to-face uh, -face contact. Uh, when the first lockdown ended, he tried to resume contact, but that was blocked. Mum made an application to court, and um, unfortunately, uh, having read his Section 7 report, uh, there are very, very serious issues around parental alienation and enmeshment involving mum now co-sleeping with an 11-year-old boy on the basis that he is terrified that the father will uh, turn up to their property, which is around about four and a half hours from where he's living. Um, Hereder, also not his real name, uh, in a relationship for nine years, child just starting school, serious physical violence against him, including two incidents where mum has stabbed him. He's failed to report uh, those, uh, sorry, he has reported those stabbings, but he, he declines to press charges. Um, he has been arrested in the past six, no, in the past 12 months, he's been arrested four times for stalking and harassment. Uh, most recently, the police agreed that there was no evidence that he had been guilty of stalking or harassment, but arrested him on the basis that mum's solicitor had alleged this. So, um, conclusions. I think, I mean, our experience is that men face structural barriers to accessing support from statutory services, police, children services, CAFCAS, etc based on what seems to be gender stereotyping. And we feel, we find from our service users that men need practical help to overcome these barriers and the problems that they create, e.g. false allegations of abuse, parental alienation, arrest for stalking and harassment, and support to access the family justice system. And that, as they say, is me done. That's brilliant. Thank you so much, Paul, for uh, for uh, sharing that. And I think it's so useful with these things to have speakers who are, you know, at the coal face, as it were, um, working with with these men day in and day out, and to, to kind of look and share those experiences. So, thank you so much for doing that. Um, we've got about. Um, yeah, we've got about five minutes. So if anybody has any questions that they want to put on the Q&A function, um, then uh, please do that now and we can kind of answer those questions. Um, and Paul, where the share screen was before, there should be an option to, to just stop sharing screen. Yeah. Um, I was hoping there might be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've now managed to shrink. <laughs> Hang on. Now it says resume share. Now, presumably, if I press, oh, there we go. Pause. I've just, I've, I've just overridden oh. you. I've just well overridden done. it. <laughs> um, brilliant. So, uh, there's just a few questions come through. Um, so, from John Barry, um, he said that uh, great to hear the update on the work with FNF BPM. Um, You've, and I was going to ask about this as well. You said that the most the type of help most requested was practical, um, whereas obviously we found from our uh, study that it was um, 
uh, mainly, mainly emotional, but 90% did still ask for practical help. I mean, the one comment I would make about that is that yours is a service that men go to, whereas ours was a call line. So there might be a difference there. Um, and that might be an anonymity uh, explanation for the anonymity thing as well. But uh, John's asked, um, how much emotional help is requested from FNF? Uh, BPM, um, what kind of help do you refer men to? And are the services that you refer men to specifically geared towards male victims or in a way that you feel actually accommodates their needs? So it's a kind of three-parter. Sure. So what we do in practical terms is we, we, we encourage and invite everybody to join our emotional support service, which we brand as the buddy scheme. Now we use a secure, well, we use a private Facebook page mm -hmm. and um, individuals are encouraged to post on that page um, because it is only open to service users who we have created, uh, who we've completed a service user pack with. Um, we believe that we are compliant with confidentiality um, protocols specifically as the majority of the people that we deal with have uh, or have had uh, a case in the family court so there are very clear very strict rules about confidentiality um, the, the individuals are able to talk with us about that but we encourage people to talk we also have um, for those people who we identify and we identify this um, in a number of ways, in terms of providing a, a higher and enhanced uh, emotional support service. So we call that unimaginatively uh, level two buddy scheme. And that provides one-to-one -one support with volunteers for the charity who have gone through um, mental health first aid training. Uh, and we provide those volunteers with a dedicated uh, mobile phone and service users are encouraged to call them up and to talk to them about the uh, what they're going through. And we identify the need for that partially through an analysis of the uh, Short Warwick Edinburgh and the Dion Gerveld. Um, but often, you know, we'll override that if somebody, for example, um, we look at the Safe Lives Risk Indicator Checklist. We specifically ask the question about uh, suicide and self-harm. We, we encourage our call um, handlers, uh, sorry, we call them outbound callers, to ensure that uh, we get a different answer. We, we specifically ask for mm. uh, a suicide, um, you know, have they, any suicide mediation. So anybody who says yes to that, we would assign a, a buddy to them. Uh, in terms of onward um, referral, we're, we're always looking to build links. We've built some links with uh, um, a couple of um, relatively small charities in South Wales, one specifically about suicide uh, prevention. But we're, we're, we're always you know, delighted to find other services that we can uh, refer on to. We, we do work with Mind. We've had meetings with Mind. So we like to do that as well. And they, are they receptive of male victims you find the organisations that you're linked with or, or more so maybe after you explain the needs to them? I, I, I think the, the, the organisations that we are linked with are receptive. And I think mm. um, that, that, that's a self-perpetuating kind of scenario, because if we weren't linked with those, you know, the, the, the other organisations who we may have approached who are not linked with us are probably less receptive to those mm. issues. Mm. Yeah, thank you so much for those answers. Um, uh, I think uh, Anne Regan is from the is from the charity. They said, Paul, I think we need to raise awareness of the lobbying we do as a charity, i.e. recording of social workers when preparing reports and assessments for family court. We see so many challenged recording should be man uh, challenging that recording should be mandatory. Um, so can I, I just think... can I just address that? I should say Anne is the vice chair of the charity. So if <laughs> I want a go. job tomorrow, I better comply. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that's not controlling behaviour in any way. Um, so yet yeah, we do we do our best to lobby and campaign. One of the things that we've noticed 
is that there's a significant discrepancy, um, if I can use that phrase, between what our service users tell us and what is reported mm. um, that they have said to statutory and other third sector organizations. And we suggested that it might be an idea um, to look at uh, social workers, be they, be they within children's services or in CAFCAS or CAFCAS Cymru, recording all of their interactions with parents mm. that they later rely on in producing any report. Mm. Now, given the prevalence of recording, um, it, it seemed to me to be not an unreasonable thing because it would provide a, an independent, auditable view of what was actually said. Um, we raised that with Welsh Government. Um, Welsh Government raised it with heads of children's services. Um, I don't think I'm able to share the detail of the response from heads of children's services, um, but suffice it to say that the mm. answer is no. Mm. Um, I've raised it in a meeting with the Chief Executive of Cath Cascanbury, who said to me, let me be clear uh, recording, routine recording of our interactions with parents mm. is non-negotiable. Mm. It will not be happening. Mm. Now, I, I don't know why um, that is the case, mm. um, but well, you know, it makes you wonder. Makes you wonder why that would be so non-negotiable. But we will. I mean, to be fair, to be fair, it has only been. Mm. Uh, let me get this right. It has only been 36 years since the Police and Criminal Evidence Act required the police to do that. So, you know, maybe another 36 years, mm. if, you know, who knows? Well, or maybe hopefully less because of the great lobbying that you guys do um, at FNF uh, BPM. Um, Thank you so much, Paul, for your insight. And I want to thank everybody for coming on to the, the seminar today. Um, and hopefully it's been useful for either you, you as an individual or as your organisation. Um, and it's been so reassuring to see people from all different kind of walks of life and jobs and roles um, uh, uh, contributing to the chat and asking questions and, and saying that they've uh, got a lot from the seminar. Um, like I said, if you want to sign up to the EBDAN mailing list, then please just email me um, at uh, ben.hine at uwl.ac.uk. Um, uh, that uh, I will add you to the list, but it will also, all future EBDAN seminars will also be sent out to the uh, UCLAN mailing list if that's where you got this one from as well. Um, so thank you all for joining. There's going to be many more throughout the year, touching on lots of different populations. And as new research comes out, we will be sharing it with you and we will be putting together seminars around that as well. Um, so thank you so much for your attendance and to our wonderful speakers. And uh, yeah, if you if, if any of the questions that you had weren't answered, I see there are still a few in the Q&A, but we don't have time, unfortunately. Please just email me with your question directly and I will make sure an answer gets back to you as well. Like I said, the slides will be available hopefully very shortly, and then the recording will also be available once we figure out uh, the forum of where that's going to be shared. But thank you so much and uh, have a good rest of hopefully a sunny day wherever you are. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much.